I have in the studio with me Paul Robeson, who needs no introduction, and Harold Winkler, who is president of Pacifica Foundation, which operates KPFA, as most of you know. Uh, Mr. Robeson has been known and loved as an artist all over the world for many years, but he has also, I believe, uh, attracted considerable and worldwide attention in his role as a world citizen and as a person who was uh, very deeply concerned about the society in which he lived. I wonder, Mr. Robeson, if we could kick off by asking, uh, when did you first become involved in the <laughs> political aspects of... May I first say how, how, how happy I am and privileged to be with you here and how deeply I thank uh, this station for its kindness throughout the years. I've been on two or three others this time, but always have been, uh, I know I've had a welcome here, so I want to thank you. I would say, as I indicate in a recent book, which is now out, it will be on the stands pretty soon, Here I Stand, story of my life as I tell it, not too autobiographical. It began when I was a, a little boy in Princeton, New Jersey. <laughs> Strange to say, I would, uh, technically, this is the shaping of my views. Uh, a Negro boy born in Princeton, New Jersey, in a college town uh, where the students mainly came from the Deep South. You know, Princeton and Princeton, Harvard and Yale was the sort of the Southern University of the North, whether you know that or not. And so I grew up in Jersey in a rather Southern atmosphere. And so, and my father was a minister and I was shaped against that background. Uh, technically, I entered the sort of the arena in the United States of fighting for social justice for my people in a concert when I was in a concert in St. Louis in 1947 in the Post-Dispatch where I was singing uh, at the Keele Auditorium, uh, one of the big auditoriums there, and the NAACP asked me in St. Louis at that time to come on a picket line because Negro people could not even sit in the theater which was just across the street. And so I grabbed a uh, uh, a banner, and lo and behold, I saw Walter Houston coming down the street. He was in the play. So Walter walked out and joined the picket line, too. <laughs> and a few nights later, when I was doing the concert, I said that I could not quite resolve the contradiction between uh, singing to an audience in St. Louis, where there was no segregation, of course, but, but also uh, the same people uh, had not, to my mind, were not fighting to see that my people could sit in the theater. It's been corrected since. And so I said that I was giving up my career technically for the moment to enter the realm of the day-to-day -day struggle of the Negro people especially. And this was your first political uh, action? That, no, that was within this context. This is very important to get into context. My first actual, to come back to your question, was in London in 1933. It isn't very well known, which I clarify in the book, that I went to play showboat in London in 1928. Jerry Curran was with me and Oscar Hammerstein. And we had a great success. And then I did concerts in 1928. And I became domiciled and lived in England, domiciled there, paid my taxes there from 1928 until 1940, after the war began. Does this mean, Mr. Robeson, <clears throat> that you spent most of your time in England during this period? It meant that I came back now and then for concerts. I was here in Oakland many times. But I went back and spent most of my time in Great Britain. That's Why? I was there in 1930, played Othello. Uh, so again, this is extremely important. At that time, I said for the public to see that I felt, I, I would explain it today in this light. We understand why many of my people have come to Oakland, to the vicinity, from Mississippi and from the South. There have been migrations into California, I understand, today from everywhere. But for many years, as you know, uh, many of my people have left the South because the conditions in the North were better. Okay. I felt the pressure so much in 1928 that instead of stopping in New York, I just went on to London. Mm. That clear. And did you feel no pressure there in I the felt racial no, sense? I felt no, nowhere near the pressure. Now, that does not mean that you haven't the background of the English colonies and so forth. Yes, but I wonder. But the pressure, but I say it's a difference between right here now and say, let's say, the Mississippi of Mr. Eastland. You understand? Yes. This is quite different. So America is quite different. There are great differences. So I found England that much more of a difference, that's all. Mm -hmm. I, felt I found Canada that way. When I was playing Othello some years ago, when we got to Toronto, the cast said to me after a week, well, Paul, why are you so different 
the, the, the play is, is much deeper, you seem to be freer. I said, that's quite true. <laughs> That's quite true. I'm in a country where, she, where there is no, this is not a question. I'm on a theater, on a stage with many other white actors. This is not a problem here. So obviously I feel freer. That's right. I'm in a different, but I don't, now I don't uh, uh, feel the pressures that one would feel in the Deep South all the time, but it would interest you to know, and I've put it, that I, and I feel any Negro, if you were honest, would have to say that even in our democracy as at present, that he is never any one second unconscious of the fact that he is a black American or a colored American. He can never be unconscious of it in any part of the United States. Mr. Robeson, have you been back to England since the last war? Oh, yes, I was back in 49. Uh, the point I wanted to 50. get at uh, is that when I was in England last year, I became aware of the large number of West Indians who are now That's about true. London. And I heard rather nasty overtones That's in right. my talks with uh, uh, some Englishmen that frightened me no question about, about a change it. that That's might right. take place in England. No, I, I, uh, again, if you want to go further, into the, nothing could be worse than South Africa. And I'm only saying I put these things down. What is most important is that at the height, uh, having lived many years out and enjoying the, f the, the certainly the height of, 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 of uh, of success in Great Britain, that I decided that I must come back to my own country to struggle in this and to make the sacrifices that I have. That's the most important thing in this regard. And I am here. Now wait, would you yes. spell this out again for me? Uh, you, you left England because England is not as attractive or oh, because no, you no. feel you have a greater mission in the United States? No, no, no. Let's don't get in that. There are many places in the world where personally it would be much easier to live than in the United States for an American Negro. In other words, and your commitment is definitely to what you feel you can do right. in this country. That's right. And Langston Hughes, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a book discussion before the book club in New York just a while ago, pointed out that every important Negro novelist, not only Richard Wright, but many others, that, that the great 95% of them live in Paris or somewhere else in the world. Mm. Why? Because the pressures are personally are much simpler. And yet, in the foreword of your book that I have before me, you quote Frederick Douglass as saying, a man is worked on by what he works on. That's right. He may carve out his circumstances, but his circumstances will carve him out as well. That's right. Is this part of the reason why you feel that you must be back in the United States? I made the decision some years ago, and I say certainly that I spring essentially from here, uh, like you threw the other day about the Indians in North Carolina. If you recall, that was in Robeson County. Yes, I noticed that in the item. Now, this is a very interesting thing, which I point out in my book, and which explains a good deal, too, of how I feel. Now, I was born on the edge of Robeson County, and my father is a Robeson and was a Robeson because he was a slave, my own father, a slave, of the Scottish Robesons who still control Robeson County in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. so, my, so I approach these problems from a very close point. And so, but I have a home, and my people are tobacco workers and sharecroppers today on, that, on plantations in that county. But a part of that soil belongs to me. That's, that's my roots. These are my roots in this country. On the other hand, also, I felt that uh, 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 so somewhere the contributions that I had uh, that could make some contribution from my background traveling about the world. However, I never expected, I am quite willing to say, that uh, I would be restricted from traveling. <laughs> yes. Well, tell me, Mr. Robeson, was your commitment to the political scene then largely as a result of uh, your feeling about your own people? or our own people, let's put it, yeah. uh, or did it have other overtones of I political say first, conviction? Like, and first it starts uh, as an American Negro interested in my own people. The other great change is very constant in my mind. I was in the Welsh Valley, and the Welsh people sing very much like we do in, in the Negro people. Yes, I've heard Many them. of our songs, beautiful songs. And I was uh, one of the few outsiders who, who has sung at a Welsh Estithforth, their, their national festival which has gone on since the time of the Druids. And I went down in the mines with the workers, and they explained to me that, Paul, you may be successful here in England, but your people suffer like ours. We are poor people, and you belong to us. You don't belong to the, to the big weeks here in this country. And so I today feel as much at home in the Welsh Valley as I would in my own Negro section, any city in the United States. And I just did a broadcast by Transatlantic Cable to the Welsh Valley a few weeks ago. And here was the first understanding that the struggle of the Negro people, or of any people, cannot be by itself. That is the human struggle. 
And so I was attracted then to, to uh, met many members of the Labour Party, and my politics embraced also the common struggle of all oppressed peoples, including especially the working masses, specifically the laboring people of all the world. And that, that defines my philosophy. It's a joining one of uh, we are a working people, a laboring people, the Negro people. And there is a unity between our struggle and those of white workers in the South. I've had white workers shake my hand and say, Paul, we're fighting for the same thing. And so this defines my attitude toward socialism and toward many other things in the world. I do not believe that a few people should control the wealth of any land, that it should be a collective ownership in the interest of all. Is that a democratic socialism or? I would have to be a democratic socialism. There are many ways, however, to to a struggle toward democracy, as I see that in a place like China, for example, today, the Soviet Union, many other places, or take our own problems uh, um, of Negroes. If we were free in the South tomorrow to carry our weight, to vote into everything, would we now look around and try to find the 10 billionaires among our people? Would we attempt to build them up, or would we try to answer the needs of the great millions of our people? And so I see other ways of life, socialism, as trying to solve the problems of millions and tens of millions of peoples at once, in a way, instead of the con instead of what we would start from the individual to the masses, they start from the masses this way. Now, there are two ways, and there are difficulties each way. I, I have made the decision to join in a collective struggle, and the reason that my personal uh, sacrifices mean very little in the struggle in one way when you see the children at Little Rock, what does, what does not giving a few concerts mean if you can make some other contribution? It's in that context. So nothing is perfect in the world. We're going toward it from different angles. I feel there's a great burden of proof on every society, on our own as well today. On our own as well. Mr. Robeson, some years ago I was talking to a French member of the Communist Party. Yes. And in the course of our discussion, he said to me, uh, you, Mr. Winkler, are a Jeffersonian Democrat. Yes. You can afford it in your rich uh, uh, land, mm. but in my land and in other lands, we must give up our freedom now to certain men in order to achieve freedom for our children in the future. This is an act of faith for me, he said, mm. giving up my mm. freedom now. Mm. Uh, do you find yourself sympathetic with... Uh, I don't think that is, uh, I would put it quite differently, no. No, do I think that's any part of, uh, of any socialist philosophy or communist philosophy, as far as I know, uh, that uh, we struck it during the, during the war under Roosevelt, for example. We had to give up many privileges. Uh, they're practically telling us we have to do that again. I mean, in any sort of a war economy, in England, England, for example, they have not eaten eggs almost for years and years because of certain pressures. And it seems to me in the socialist lands, the Soviet Union, China, and many places, that that's quite true. Uh, it's one thing to say today uh, that they don't have as, uh, as shining apparel as we do, but they have uh, made tremendous scientific progress and within a one generation, so to speak, within 40 years, have become one of the most powerful countries in the world. Now, they've done it by great sacrifices and not by, to my mind, uh, uh, they feel that the country in one sense, the man in the street, uh, may not in every essence belong to him, but he feels it's much more his than, say, uh, I do in Charleston, South Carolina, when one Ameri uh, Southern American Negro explained to me that I was in the state of our great plantations. I said, are you sure about that, our great plantations? I don't feel that they're my plantations. Uh, but in one sense, some of the people in socialist lands feel that the country does belong to them in a, a real sense. Now, they are, they are uh, uh, and as far as the basic uh, uh, con concept of, uh, of the dictatorship of the proletariat and so forth, isn't it? Uh, I would say, again, bring it back to our own history. There was, as we know, a dictatorship of the North over the South in the days following the Civil War. When that di dictatorship was removed, uh, the, the, the colored people reverted practically into a kind of servitude. I could have conceived of, uh, of a dictatorship over the South for quite a longer period, from my point of view, quite, quite frankly. So this is understandable. Yes. In your book, Mr. Robeson, uh, Here I Stand, you have a chapter uh, entitled The Power of Negro Action. That's right. Uh, what are some of the specific acts <laughs> which you recommend and perhaps in the order of priority? Yeah. Well, I say any, in any Negro life, you would say that 
nobody, this is, seems to be rather startling to many of my friends. Nobody would be startled, say, with taking the vote of the power of Italian action, or Polish action in Detroit, or Catholic action in New York, and so forth. I mean, that the vote would be a, a block, and the power of the Negro vote in the North in certain states. This is one very important aspect, uh, very clear. A kind of, uh, uh, we have tremendous economic power in this, uh, in this land today. Uh, there should be tremendous support of Negro business, of Negro banks and so forth, of loan associations and so forth. But the prime thing is, is that I'm convinced that... Yes. Ta taking this last yeah. uh, uh, illustration of yours, have you not found that uh, as Negro bankers uh, 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 become richer that they grow away from uh, your people? Uh, no, I don't. I, I, I uh, know do they that, remain they, a part they, of they, they total remain, Negro action? There's no way for, as I said before, for any American Negro, however wealthy, however famous, to be anything at this period of our history at some point than an American Negro. If he oh, doesn't know, it, I can if see if he doesn't a, know it, he, he'll, he'll find it out. From a racial standpoint, yeah, Mr. Robeson, yeah. but from the political standpoint of socialism, which you were discussing a few mm. moments ago, surely a Negro capitalist, uh, if he had the opportunity, would undoubtedly behave uh, according to the lights of his own. Uh, he has to, but business. he. But I know many of the most wealthy, and they often I feel that they don't help as much as they should. But he's forever conscious his children suffer the same things as the poor Negro's children, and at some point he finds a way to uh, to help. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a little different even there. But that is, uh, you're, in other words, you feel it correct. tracks through yeah. in a but different I, but way. But I'm really not. Uh, the, what I'm trying to say is that is that somewhere for our own dignity, I see that is Africa. Would you understand Ghana today unifying as a, with its own? sort of, uh, you know, nationalist strength. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. I feel in America, strange to say, especially in the South, that, uh, that uh, even with all the goodwill of uh, white liberals in the country, that it's very important for the Negro people to know what they want and to unify to do it. Often in a very simple case of fighting segregation, one group of Negroes can be drawn aside because of political pressure, other pressures. We should unify too. We should unify. Yes, I it, feel there's got to be a unity in order to integrate. That's what I feel. But I feel that we've, we, are not, we just can't integrate as individuals. Yes. But isn't the example of Liberia, uh, for example, a sorry example, uh, as it said against Ghana? Well, yes, because of, uh, that's a very simple. The Firestone uh, has taken care of that. It has been exploited to its hilt by Firestone rubber, if you don't know the facts. Yes, right. it still remains then right. an economic and question. And so has rather Ghana. Than a racial so unity, has Ghana, I Rather see. than a racial unity question. It remains an economic uh, uh, question no, in no. its fundamentals no, rather I think than the Ghana unity of also, the Negro people. Ghana has uh, the, the unity of its own nation, same as Chinese or Indians, very close to India. India's just, they have a, a culture and a history that has its own national characteristics. But what will prevent Ghana from becoming another Liberia? That's the... What do you mean? Well, from, because Liberia of the today pressures. is completely controlled by Firestone, not by Africans. But I, but I, but I feel that Nkrumah is going to control the economy of Ghana, and at some time be strong enough to say to the European, either you sit here and acknowledge that we run our own country, like Nehru, or else you go. But I don't see the day when Liberia can tell Firestone to do that. Oh, they're quite different. They're quite different. Liberia is a complete vassal state of American capital, finance capital, without question. They have nothing to say, nothing whatsoever. What is your reaction to the passive resistance as practiced in Montgomery? Well, very, I think there was a magnificent movement, and nobody can I say there's nothing as far as the general thing of a nonviolent solution of the problem. This is the, uh, there could be no other solution within our, uh, 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 within the frame of things today. I mean, this is a very important, uh, contribution. Uh, uh, nobody could think of a violent solution unless the Negroes, unless somebody wanted to, 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 to ask somebody to be destroyed. I mean, that would be absurd. On the other hand, within that framework, I think that, that the Negro people have to be extremely militant and, ex and, and demand a little more than they are demanding today, and to do a little more, not to do, to do, to do something, to do other things as well as pray, let me put it, as well as pray. Do you think there's been a change in the attitude of the Negro churches toward militant political and economic action, Mr. Rose? I think there has, because it's history, you know. Take Frederick Douglass. I belong to the AME Zion Church, 
there is one in this area. And uh, Douglas was a part of that church. Harriet Tubman, who formed the Underground Railroad, who was called the Moses of our people. They sang Go Down Moses when she came into the South to free the slaves. And Harriet Tubman. And we have a tradition of tremendous, uh, consistent speaking out, you know, for our rights. Like in the whole civil rights struggle. I mean by militant, uh, letting people know that you, that you want to be free like anybody else. And I think the churches, however, a lot of the responsibility still rests upon our churches because that's where so many of our people, uh, you know, go. They have tremendous influence still. Mr. Robeson, do you think your artistry as a singer and uh, actor have suffered because <laughs> of your involvement in political action or profited? They have not. I feel that they have profited. They've only suffered when they've suffered by the fact that because of my political views, which I certainly did not expect in a democracy, that I've been prevented from exercising my craft. However, I've kept singing all through the years. Uh, you may be able to test it pretty soon. I just made a recording the other day for Vanguard, which they felt was superior to any records I have ever made. My voice is still in fine shape. I've been in the area. And as far as Othello, I've worked on it. I feel I've just been invited to play at, Str at Stratford-on-Avon, uh, the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre in England, in, as far as you say, in Pericles, to play the part of Gower. And I would certainly do Othello at some point in London, and I feel I would give a better performance. Uh, I feel that in every, and I, I've got a lot of things here which we won't be able to get to in my music, comparing the folk music of the world, I would say that my interest in my art has deepened just no end in the last years. And I've become interested in the music of Bartok, of Mussorgsky, many folk things, the, the, the unity of the folk music of the world, which has sprung from my political conviction that all people should be unified. I have seen it expressed in their music, and I do a program, which of all the songs of all the peoples in the world, suggesting that we are all one human family, it all comes to that. So I feel that basically that it has deepened my, uh, my on the other hand, I have never separated my work as an artist, from my work as a human being. I've always put it even more strongly that, to me, my art is always a weapon. It's got to be good art. Othello was a weapon in racial relations, or, or at least showing that uh, we can do some things too. I played football. My father explained to me that, well, a fellow hit me, I couldn't hit him back because they'd say we were bad and savage, so I had to stand and be knocked all around. Uh, I had to do well in my studies. So. I've never been able to divorce one thing from the other. Uh, and luckily, I don't uh, sing the kind of songs that may, you're here and you hit the high, uh, whatever it is, the high uh, B flat and the high this and the high that. I sing songs that express very much the emotions of different peoples, like the Welsh, the Scotch, the Negro, Chinese, Russian, so forth. Well, what is the present state of play on this passport business? You were talking about your British invitations. Yes. Uh, how are you going to get there? Well. Luckily, I think at this point, the basic case is before the Supreme Court. It's the case of Rockwell Kent, uh, contending that the, which the whole, all the cases revolve around, that when the State Department put in its administrative necessities that one sign a non-communist affidavit, whether or not he is, was, or so forth, that this is a violation of constitutional rights. Uh, just wasn't just any any American now has to sign this uh, this particular proposal, and this is before the Supreme Court. And in its present temper, uh, it seems to me that the court might easily decide. And this is what you refuse to do. Right. You refuse to sign such a document. Oh, yeah, completely refuse. This is a complete invention. Did you, you know? Did, did you murder your wife yesterday or, or you know, the day before? Are you, are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? This is nobody. My political opinions are my own business, you know. This is a complete, uh, complete... Uh, and I say we have the background of the, of the reversal in the Smith Act cases all over this country. So somebody was framed, I would say. So it shows that all of it, to my mind, is a complete hoax from somewhere. In other words, you're hoping that on the basis of some of the current court decisions yeah. that uh, you may get your passport in time to go Yes, to or I have now been invited to sing on April 6 in a national television uh, broadcast. Maybe I could get special permission to go. I mean, uh, there, there, and because of my background in England, there is almost a national, almost demand from England or request that I be allowed to come in April and even before the summer. And also, I take... Uh, some optim optimistic point of view from the fact that where no passports are needed, uh, after restricting me for many years, even in that area, 
this was had to be lifted because the courts would certainly, have, I think, have ruled that this was was completely illegal. Once I was stopped from going to Hawaii, Puerto Rico, which are parts of the United States, uh, so I can now go anywhere in this hemisphere. Oh, which you're means not dangerous as long as you stick to the Western Hemisphere. I'm just saying. So I'm just saying. What if a court is looking at this? How can the State Department argue that if I leave the country, this is extremely dangerous? The guy he got up in court, the fellow, and if I left, it was going to be a catastrophe. I don't know what would happen the next morning. Immediately, I get on the plane. But I can now be in Brazil, I can be in the West Indies, I can be in Canada, I can be anywhere in this hemisphere. Why can't I be in London? It doesn't make any sense to me. So I, I'm optimistic that, that I may get my passport. Mr. Rosen, However, <coughs> if we may change Yes, I'd like to direction. get to my concert. <laughs> uh, could, could I, uh, uh, however, uh, ask you some questions uh, along another line for a moment? I have three small children of yeah. my own, and I'm very much interested in the problems of uh, children uh, yeah. uh, with relation to these larger problems of a man yeah. standing up for certain things. Yeah. Ha have your children moved around the world with you? Uh, in the course of your travels? Well, I just have one boy. Oh, you just have one boy? Just one boy. And he, as you know, traveled around, but from the time he was about two, traveled with me everywhere, and lived in England, and went to school for a part of his youth in the Soviet Union. He speaks Russian very well. And uh, he is now in this country, went to Cornell, and he has two beautiful grandchildren. And uh, uh, he... Uh, he is very happy. His was a, a mixed marriage in one sense. He married a very wonderful Jewish girl of a Romanian Jewish background, and they're extremely happy. Have two this children. This is concentrating live in all the problems. All the problems. <laughs> and they are very happy and get along very well in Harlem, where they live in the Negro community. They are both, may I say, to use a much abused term, progressive young Americans. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he's an electronics engineer and a very fine acoustical engineer. We've done some work together. And uh, she teaches in school, teaches children. There are two children in school, so she teaches in you know, young children in school. And they're very happy. And my wife is a, an accredited correspondent at the United Nations and does a lot of work for different publications throughout the world. So we keep pretty busy. And uh, But I am very happy to get to the core, be back at my singing, and to say that however I have talk this afternoon that I have great faith. I wouldn't be here if I did not have great faith in our, that somewhere we will realize the, demo, the democratic potentials of our life, of our, of our society. I, I deeply believe that. I uh, fight for peace. I feel we've got to live with many other kinds of systems and other beliefs in the world. We've been able to do it through many generations and centuries. That's the reason why we couldn't find peace in that destruction. Uh, and. Uh, and a little faster in understanding the problems of oppressed peoples, wherever they may be. But very uh, happy to be back in the area to sing. In fact, I've come back here, you know, sung in the Negro churches at the Third Baptist in, in San Francisco, and I sang in Oakland, and, and I sang in Sacramento and Stockton, and have been back at my career now for quite some time, mainly in the Negro churches. Has this been a change? Uh, uh, I was not aware that you had, had been singing in the Negro ch churches yes. up until recently. Yes. Uh, well, I wasn't able to sing anywhere else. I wasn't able to get the auditoriums. On the other hand, we have a great tradition in Negro life. All of us, Marion Anderson, uh, Hayes, we all began in Negro churches. And my brother is pastor of a very large church in New York. And every Sunday afternoon, you may go there and hear any of the top Negro artists in the whole concert field, Warfield, anybody. We always go back to the churches. And so it's been a very fine way to walk into a church full of about 2,000 people and say, well, Paul's here this morning, and it's just to see how he sounds. <laughs> <laughs> it comes out very nice. well, why, why, why fine? But I really have begun and been practicing, and, and my whole, I mean, come, have come back into the swing of things in this area. And I want to say that, that I go so far as to say in this period, some people have said no, but I have found the Pacific Coast, especially the Bay Area, uh, vastly different. I have found it very different in feeling from some other sections of the United States. Other people have felt this. Many outside people who have come near to the United Nations gatherings feel that you are a little more non-hysterical, that you have a little evidently deeper belief in our democratic faith. And I have, I have felt that. I felt that. So much so that I may even come out to sit around for quite a while out here. Well, we think it's a wonderful city. <laughs> when may we uh, hear you sing in the near future? Well, you're going yeah. to hear me, I hope, on Sunday afternoon, February 9th, at the Oakland Auditorium Theater.
be very important. It's the first time I've had a public auditorium in the area for quite some time. It's, uh, it's sponsored by an out, uh, a committee in Negro Life and honoring Negro History Week, which you know is, has been honored now for some time. And Mr. William Duncan Allen, a very gifted uh, pianist who's, who is uh, accompanying me and who is chairman of the Bach Festival in the Berkeley area, is uh, playing many, uh, some compositions of leading Negro composers. It's an afternoon of music and poetry. I'm reciting some Shakespeare and some Negro and poetry from Negro uh, poets and uh, singing, as I say, music that ranges through all the folk music of the world. And those composers like Bartok and Musokski and Dvorak who have used the folk idiom in their, in their, in their extended and more complex works. It sounds as if it will be a delightful afternoon. Well, I hope so. <laughs> and uh, we are very grateful to you for coming along to KPFA. I'm grateful Good to you. Luck, Mr. Robson. Thank you, Mr. Robson.